everybody and welcome back for Fall Broadcast Week 4. We're your hosts, Ranger Madison and Ranger Alyssa. You'll be able to see this broadcast every Thursday at 2 on Facebook and YouTube. And then if you miss it, we'll also put it on our website. Yeah, each week we are going to do a peak check. We have fall photos to share, um, a few from our Flickr site, which we will show later. We'll do some tips for visiting, and we have a special guest at the end with a special guest ranger. Our forecast for this week is we're expecting to see some rain, so it's important to keep in mind that rain means that the leaves are slippery when wet, so make sure you keep an eye out on your footing. The pro of us having some rain this week, though, is our waterfalls will be beautiful. Our color progression this week is we are still seeing a lot of green, but there's also these great flashes of yellow. We're seeing some more of that. But if for some reason you come up here and you're not seeing the color that you anticipated seeing, there's still lots to see. Don't worry, it's coming. But if all else fails and you're looking for something to do, go have a slice of blackberry ice cream pie at the lodge. Oh yeah. <laughs> In some parts of the park, our color progression is, say, probably at about 10%, so we're still seeing a lot of green, but we've also got a lot of yellow that we're starting to see with our hickories and our birches. Uh, we're still seeing the reds along the Virginia creepers, and we're starting to see a little bit of orange here and there. So, Yeah, another way to track the fall progression in the park is to go on our website, and we have some live webcams set up. Um, there's one at Big Meadows and one that's called Mountain View and it shows a view of pinnacles and the valley below and again those can be found on our website and our fall, uh, fall webpage. One of our tips for visiting this week is to check out your fall bulletin. You get this as soon as you enter the park and it's a great resource for knowing what is what. We've got a little bit of a schedule and we've got our ranger program, so go and check it out. Also, check out our website and our concessioner's website at goshenandoa.com. Um, there was a lot of really great information there, and it's a great way to plan. Yeah, absolutely, and look at our app, the National Park Service app, and you can search Shenandoah, and that's a really great resource. Um, you can use it as a tool for before your trip, for trip planning, mm -hmm. and then you can also use it if you download the offline content when you're in the park so you can still use it even if the service is a little spotty. And then not to sound like a broken record, <laughs> but we are going to talk about our digital passes again. They're super, super important if you want to speed up your entrance into the park. So again, go onto recreation.gov and you can purchase your pass there. You can either screenshot it or print it out bring it with you to the entrance station, show it to a ranger with your ID, which the entrance station rangers do want to say thank you to all of their visitors for showing those and having those ready. And then you can just head on into the park and get your experience started pretty soon. Now that we are into October, it's important for us to talk about pumpkins in the campground. We love to see the fall spirit, but it's important to note that what you see as a super cute decoration and we'll see is food. So do not leave those out. Treat them the same way as you would your cooler. Put them away when you're not at your campsite. The other important thing that we need to talk about is picnic ground etiquette. Remember to stay not too close to other people and to clean up after yourselves and put out your fires. Yeah, and if you bring your pet into the park, be sure to pick up after your pet. So make sure <laughs> that you bring a bag so you can pick up the poop and then take it with you and find a trash receptacle um, near you and to keep it on a leash no longer than six feet. And if your goal is to see wildlife while you're in the park, then it might be a better idea to leave your pet at home um, because what scares animals? Other animals. So just keep that in mind when you venture into the park. Here are a couple of your photos from Flickr this week. If you guys have missed it, we've been soliciting your photos on flickr.com slash group slash shenfall. So if you'd like to be featured in the next fall broadcast, go ahead and upload your fall photos there. We really want to see your 2021 fall pictures. So make sure that they are current and they are of the fall colors. Yeah, make sure to also include the location and date, the 2021 date, please. <laughs> and we would love to share them here every week. And now we're going to toss it over to Ranger Dawn. And she spoke with Gabriel Maple, who is an official hawk counter for the annual hawk migration. So let's check it out. Welcome to Rockfish Gap. I am your host, Ranger Dawn, here with a special guest who has, we can say, a lifelong history of working with raptors and other wildlife. He is an official counter for Rockfish Gap Hawk Watch and is taking the time to talk with us today about the annual raptor migration that is happening right now right above us. 
Gabriel Maple. It is an honor to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you, Don. It's great to be here. Excellent. Tell us what is happening up here on the mountain. Yeah, so we're here at Rockfish Gap and we're counting the migrating raptors. We're actually doing an official count of the migrating raptors, uh, hawks, eagles, falcons, osprey, uh, and other birds of prey as they migrate from north to south along the Blue Ridge Mountains through Shenandoah National Park and over Rockfish Gap and farther south. We have over 13 species of raptors total that migrate over here every year. We're here every year from August 15th to November 30th to conduct an, an official count of those migrating raptors as they pass by. What um, is the range that these birds are going and how come they're all migrating right now? That's a great question. So uh, with it being you know fall and, and the change of the seasons, the birds have to adapt to that. So uh, not all bird species are migratory, but the majority of them are. The reason they migrate at this time of year is to get away from the cold temperatures and also as the food sources change, they have to follow the foods. What are the birds doing coming right through this area, congregating? So they're following the ridge line primarily. That's why we conduct our official count here on the mountain rather than down in the valley um, because the ridge line is a defined flyway and birds like to follow defined flyways. Um, people think for one reason it's because it gives them a you know, a line of topography to follow. It gives them some landmark to follow, um, but also because it is easier them, for them to find wind along the ridges. So they want to get where they're going uh, with expending as little energy as possible. So some of these birds, especially the broad winged hawks, which is the most common species, they're going all the way to South America for the winter. Maybe that's a long way to go. So what we'll often see with the hawks is they'll be kettling, and we call it kettling when they swarm in a big group, either riding a wind updraft or a thermal. And then when they reach the top of that column of air, they stream out to the south and set their wings and start heading south in the direction they want to go along the ridge line. And they're not flapping their wings. They're not really expending energy, but they're, therefore they're also slowly losing altitude. And then they'll hit another thermal or another column of wind and ride that up and repeat the process. So that's one strategy that they use to expend as little energy as possible. And it's easier to find those thermals and wind drifts along the ridge, which is why they're following this flyway. That, when the birds are floating around in those kettles, um, yeah. I, to me, that's something it just looks amazing and it looks calm and peaceful. But your job out here is to count them. Um, and I imagine that just must, must look like people mosh pitting, <laughs> like it must be crazy. How does that work? How do you figure out how many birds are up there? That's a great question. So uh, that is a, an important part of this, obviously, is we're conducting an official count and we need to get an accurate number. And, and sometimes it's easy. Like this morning, we had a small kettle of hawks go over. It was only about 30 birds. Um, which is a relatively small kettle. Uh, we, can, we can see groups of up to 2,000 hawks in one kettle. So 30 is, is, is a nice, small, medium-sized group. Um, and when it's a group that small, or even if it is a larger and, and a larger tall group, they, they generally, they'll often hit the top of that thermal. The air sort of disperses out the thermal end sort of at the top. And they'll reach that, you know, one bird at a time or three birds at a time, and they'll start streaming out like I talked about but only one or three at a time. So we don't count them when they're swirling. We count them as they stream out the top of that thermal and are, and are just gliding. It makes it much easier to count. So, so what does an official counter with Hawkwatch do? Yeah, so when we submit our data to the Hawk Migration Association North America, it's important that the data is reliable and accredited. A lot of, you know, we certainly encourage everyone to go out and watch the hawks, but it takes a lot of practice to be able to identify and separate the 13 different species, especially when they're at a distance. And here, a lot of our birds are really high and distant. You need binoculars uh, and spotting scopes in order to be able to identify them well. So we need people that have, one, have that high quality data. We're all volunteers, so we, we rely on the volunteers to bring their own equipment. So we rely on people that have that good equipment and then also the experience to be able to use that equipment to successfully identify the hawks often at great distances. Mm -hmm. So as a hawk watcher, I started coming up here. I spent a few years sitting alongside the people that were already official counters and they were teaching me how to separate the subtle clues of behavior and flight pattern and shape mainly. It is a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad we could talk about hawks today. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> There's nothing more exciting, right? Absolutely. <laughs>